let's use differential forms to talk about something super super cool. I'm not gonna. I'm trying try not to give anything away uh, to see if you can recognize what's happening. Uh, if you're familiar with what I'm, what we're gonna connect it to. Um, but here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna do some calculations with one, two, and three forms in R4, which we've done a little bit of. But we're gonna do some a weird switch. I call it a perverse twist here. Um, the main things we're gonna do is sign switch. And in addition to that, we're gonna do a little notation switch. Instead of one through four as the indices, we're gonna do zero through three. Not everybody does that, um, but I like to do it. And uh, it suggests that the zero is gonna be special. It's gonna be sort of separated out in some way. And that's exactly what the sign switch is about. We have this special coordinate x naught, and we're going to change the dot product on uh, everything, including on forms. And the, it's a very simple rule. We just put a minus anywhere a zero is involved. So if alpha and beta are one forms, we get a minus here. Gamma and delta are two forms. Then if the component has any zeros in it, like the delta zero three is matched with dx zero, or dx naught, I'll call it, uh, dx naught wedge dx three, then um, we're gonna put a minus three, a minus here. And so there's a lot of minuses as we get up here since everything has zeros in it, except for this guy. Okay, so um, the tilde operation, connecting field, uh, vector fields and form, one forms, is intimately connected with the dot product. I haven't said too much about that, but take, uh, take my word for it right now. We haven't, um, there's, there's more we could say about it. And so we're gonna redefine the tilde operation as well so that we put a minus sign in here. Um, and so in a little while, we're going to use this new notion of the dot product to redefine the star operator. First, though, we're actually just going to look at a two form and look at d of that two form is equal to zero and investigate a little bit about what that could be useful for. And I'm going to give us a very suggestive notation to our two form. F is going to be our two form. I'm going to not use a Greek letter for once because this is a very standard letter for what it's going to turn out to be. And it's going to be, I just have six components. This is writing out the general two form. Uh, because I like to put the x naughts first and because there's going to be a very specific thing I'm matching to, I'm putting minus signs in front of these e's and then notice these ones which have no zero component are called b's. Okay, so first question, just calculate df and suppose we're looking at df equals zero. So that says that f is a closed two form. So f, the terminology of that is it's a closed two form, just means df equals zero. And that is going to give us explicit equations relating the derivatives of e and b. And I claim that they very might well look familiar, and the letters are a big, a big, big hint. Okay, so let's do the calculation. Uh, we're going to calculate, we're going to say 0 equals df equals, and I'm going to start out the calculation by hand, and then I'm going to steal it from uh, below uh, where I have it all pre-worked out. So remember, when we're doing d, we theoretically take all four partial derivatives of e1, but if we took the x0 or x1 derivative, we would then put in an extra dx naught or dx1 and it's gonna die. So we're gonna get minus partial derivative of e1 with respect to x2, and then that's gonna be times dx2, that's the rule, uh, wedge the stuff that's already there. So notice, of course, it's gonna become a three form. And then another derivative, <coughs> minus partial derivative, <coughs> excuse me, of e1 with respect to e x3. And then let me just steal all this stuff and just change it. That first one, x3. Now, oh, I forgot to mention, with the f here, notice how it's written out. When there's an x0 involved, I put it first. And all the other one, 2, 3, I'm actually writing in cyclic order. Because even though this is r4, and I said before, cyclic order isn't very applicable to r4, we're treating that x0 as special. And so it's kind of a, an R combined with an R3 artificially. And, um, and so the cyclic order trick actually is very helpful for getting signs to be nice. Okay, so that's just gonna be two out of 12 terms we're gonna get out of this. And obviously we're gonna got, wanna kind of uh, organize it. What, it what, what's gonna happen? For example, x2, x0, x1, that's gonna show up one more time um, from taking, or three, two more times actually. Um, we're going like the x naught x2, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna see there's a derivative of that with respect to x1 that's going to give us this. Um, and then there's an x2, there's, here we got x1 and x2, a derivative of b3 with respect to x naught is also gonna, gonna appear as well. So there's really only four different 
basis three forms. It just depends on which number is left out here. And so we're going to get four groups of three when we continue to do this. Okay, so I'm going to go below here and steal that. Okay, and so here's what we actually get. I'll just run through it kind of quickly. So, um, and this has, it hasn't been organized yet. Just working out all these derivatives by hand. Uh, so, for example, the B1, we get derivative with respect to x0 and with respect to x1, and we just put those in here. So here's the 12 terms unorganized. And you might want to pause. As usual, I suggest you pause and kind of do as much work on your own as you want if you actually want to learn this. It's really, I think it, you might actually be able to somewhat learn it if you actually do it yourself. Here's with the terms organized. And now uh, we might start getting an inkling of what's very, very interesting about, about writing a two form in this way and then taking D of it. So the B's, there's these B derivatives that match with the ones that are just one, two, and three, no zero involved. And so for example, one of them was from here. And if we look at what the B derivatives are, b1, x1, b2, x2, b3, x3, that's interesting. If we think of the b's as the components of a vector field, that's exactly the divergence of the vector field b. And remember, we're setting this all to 0. And so we're going to say the divergence of b has got to be 0. That might sound familiar. OK, and then the ones with the time component, we're going to get two of them coming from the e's, because they already have the, the, the zero component. Oops, I gave it away. Um, and then we're going to get something coming from the b's, where we have to take this x0 derivative to get the x0 in there. Okay. So to say this four form is zero, it just says all, that all these four functions are equal to zero. Okay, so this is very, very suggestive. So let's let um, vector field e be equal to, of course, e1 i plus e2 j plus e3 k. And well, to be systematic, I could call those these guys like little e1, little e2, little e3. Maybe I should do that. OK. And let's do the same for vector field b. OK. And let's see what this is saying. It seems to be saying something about these vector fields. OK, so it looks like we've taken two vector fields in space and done this funky thing in the 1, 2, and 3 coordinates. I keep giving it away. Um, and putting them together in this weird way of making it into a 2 form, put the b's with the 1, 2, 3 coordinates and match the e's with this new x0 coordinate. What on earth could that be? Hmm. Well, we'll see in just a second. OK. Then. Uh, df equals 0, we can translate that into a statement about these vector fields. It means that div b equals 0, bold that because it's a vector field. And let's see, the other one's a little harder to figure out, but we want to look at, we almost want to treat the 0 specially. Notice here the b components change, but the, the derivative doesn't. And so what we're really getting is. Um, the derivative of b with respect to x0, so it's the derivative of this vector b with respect to x0, okay, um, and then plus, and then we have to be careful about um, the signs here. This would be, this would be the first component, the x1 component of db dx0. This would be, notice the 3 and the 2, the 1 is what's missing. This would be the first component of the curl of E. And if you check the sign, it really is with that correct sign. Um, and so that's going to be curl E. OK. And so that combination is equal to 0. And I don't need that to be bold. It bothers me when that's bold. OK. Now, this is the point where either you're familiar with this or you're not. These are two of Maxwell's equations in differential form. These are Maxwell's two homogeneous equations, the one that don't mention uh, charges and currents. And um, I, since I'm a mathematician, I've suppressed all the units. And suppose, since I wanted it to be surprised, uh, so units chosen 
so that um, basically like uh, epsilon naught and mu naught that are usually appear in these equations are equal to one. And you can choose units to do that, trust me, okay? And of course, this is what the mystery x sub zero is, surprise, surprise, this only replicates uh, Maxwell if this is a time variable. And x sub zero equals t. So what we've done is we're in space time. We have put together space and time into one unit and it turns out that's a wonderful thing to do, especially when combined with, combined with differential forms. It allows us to state half of Maxwell's equations, the homogeneous ones, with four symbols, d, f equals zero. So we've combined, it turns out that the E and the B fields, they're not just two related fields in the same kind of theory, they are two, they are just uh, three, uh, two triples of components of the same exact object. So F, uh, F stands for Faraday, okay, and it's the Faraday two form. Um, he didn't know about two forms, but he had some intuitions that can be thought of as, as leading directly to, to this idea of combine these together into something that's flowing, uh, a, something in space and time that's a two form. Okay, so that in itself is already pretty cool, but it really begs the question. Here's half of Maxwell's four equations. How do you get the other ones? Where do they come from? Okay, so um, that's a good place to stop this video, but we'll continue uh, in the other videos. You might want to just take a glance at the next problem, which we're going to do.